All right, welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast today. We have a legendary strength and conditioning coach, Ashley Jones. Welcome, Ash. Thanks very much, James. Pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation, mate. No, this is actually the first time we've actually like sat down and talked for, or face-to-face through a camera, at least, isn't it? We've, we've messaged back and forth every now and then, so it's, it's, good, to, it's good to find again. I remember, actually, I, I must have messaged you like 10-plus years ago when I was first starting... Yeah, I think it was you were on the ASCA podcast way right. back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I messaged you and you sent me all of your conditioning games. And I was like, holy shit, they just got a whole folder. That was So thank you for that from 10 plus years ago. <laughs> no problem. It's, uh, I think it's important, really. It's um, Since I've been around in this industry for quite a few years, I think um, I'm actually quite amazed at the, the number of times I hear uh, other coaches say that, They've requested something from someone and the person's either never replied or has sent mm. them such a small amount. So I've tried to be the, the complete opposite. And uh, I think that stems from many, many years ago being a kid involved with rugby and, and just uh, writing a letter to a guy that I thought was a, uh, a great leader. And um, he responded to, to me out of the blue as a – I think I must have been 15 years old at the time – and he sent me a um, eight-page written letter about um, answering oh, the questions wow. I had for him. And I think ever since that time, if if someone in his position took the time to to uh, reply to someone completely uh, unknown to him, uh, it's only good and proper that um, I should continue that tradition, and, and I have uh, from that day onwards. Yeah, I mean, you, you share a lot. But do you want to maybe give a little brief background about, about yourself too because you've worked with pretty much every – big professional rugby competition there is, isn't it? Um, there's been a few. It's uh, <laughs> I've had one year round. I, I was just thinking the other day is that uh, I've coached, um, coached in seven countries across four continents, and I've spoken uh, in conferences and seminars uh, on five continents, and I've actually played or been a part of rugby games on six continents. So... I'm still hanging out for Antarctica in some way, shape, or form. Whether that will probably just be as a tourist at some stage, but uh, um, I've almost got the of the big seven anyway. So uh, it has been um, uh, a great journey, uh, probably 30, 35 years now, I guess, um, or close to it in professional professional sport as a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I love that. And well, while this podcast kind of gears towards com- combat sports, man, there's just so much to learn from all the other sports and. Honestly, rugby is, I swear, is the closest to combat sports in terms of training, training your fight. So it's, it's awesome to, to, to chat on this too. But I wanted to dive into some of your, I, kind of like your philosophy, strength conditioning wise. But one specific question I know with some, a lot of your programs, you group athletes based on like metabolic, neuromuscular, or speed and things like that. Do you want to maybe just dive into kind of how you came down to these classifications for the athletes and, and how you decide where they fit within that program? Yeah, sure thing, James. Um, I think that stems from probably my love of um, mathematics and physics. And uh, I still remember when I first met uh, Dr. Mel Siff uh, many years ago when he came to Australia where I was uh, living at the time. And he, from memory, I think he had a PhD in engineering and then uh, did a PhD across in biomechanics as well. So uh, one of the most brilliant men that's uh, been involved with our industry ever mm-hmm. had that rich, rich ideas about um, how mathematics plays a role in physics and how physics plays a role in biomechanics and how biomechanics plays such a massive role in, in weight training, strength training. So um, I guess that's uh, where my initial ideas, because I've always been uh, interested in the engineering side of things, so I came up with um, an idea of um, – so <laughs> let, me, let me go back a little bit. Hopefully that'll be fine. But uh, yeah. my interest in engineering looked at, uh, well, you've got mechanical engineering and chemical engineering. Why don't we apply this to uh, strength training, conditioning training, and look at um, the neural side, neural engineering, which would be more speed and power, mechanical engineering, which would be more size and strength, looking at mm-hmm. muscle, okay. things like that. And then, for want of a better word, metabolic engineering, which uh, is looking at the um, – the fitness elements associated and how we can actually use that. And I primarily do my metabolic conditioning through circuit training in the gym. 
So um, that's how that part came to be. And then uh, neural engineering is really about development of speed and power and uh, looking at a group of individuals that you get initially when you first start with that team. I've always sort of sat down, had conversations with the individual players, asked them where they feel they need to spend time training. Looking at also talking to the medical staff and looking at if they've got uh, any uh, restraints as far as their injury history. And uh, uh, so I guess with the, uh, the the neural side, neuro um, mechanical side of my training, I'm looking at speed and power training. So really looking at um, application of Olympic style lifting techniques, looking at uh, say dynamic effort models associated with uh, the West Side and Lewis Simmons model, uh, looking at uh, power exercise with a contrast plyometric, that sort of activity as far as training. And I usually have a traffic light system depending on whether a person's uh, fully recovered and 100% up for it. So they get the green green to go light and that will sometimes often be a French contrast method in that particular type of training. Uh, it could be an amber light, which will be, they've still not 100%, but um, they're relatively good to go. So that will be a combination of uh, a traditional weight training exercise of more explosive nature and a plyometric. And then the red, red sign will be basically, well, they're not 100%, but we still want to do some uh, speed and power work. So we might just do some traditional exercises with, um, with acceleration and speed. So that's sort of elements. Mechanical side is more uh, size and strength work. So traditional strength training methods, a lot of cluster type training, uh, a lot of wave loading type training as far as that's mm -hmm. concerned. Or whether a person needs a, a greater increase in their um, uh, muscle mass, so more leaning towards a more uh, hypertrophy type training program. And then metabolic is all about circuits. So, um, but I often found that uh, people are hybrids of those three areas. So mm. they'll either be a neurometabolic, so that means they'll be doing some neural training and also need some metabolic training. So I often like to do double day training. So I like to do the neural training session first or whatever the prioritization is. If it's uh, a metabolic neural, then the metabolic work would be done first and neural would be done in the afternoon, although that probably goes against the grain as far as uh, <laughs> physiology is concerned, but mine's more about needs-based programming. So whatever we need to do, we need to prioritise in the first part of the day. So determining on determining what individual players may be, that's where the fun comes in. So conversations with the player, conversations with medical staff to see if there's any uh, – any anomalies in there in the particular physical makeup that we need to take consideration for or the injury history that we need to address and also looking at their coaching staff as well. So does a player need to get bigger, stronger in their eyes? Does a player need to get um, fitter? Or does a player need to get faster, more explosive? So we can actually take all those areas and blend them in the pot and then discuss it with the player because I think the player needs um, to be a part of this discussion so they're actually – improving the compliance of the individual to the type of training that we're actually doing. And then um, we roll the program out and we roll the program for probably four to six weeks. Uh, and then we reassess, talk to the player on that every four to six weeks to see if they're, they're happy with the progress, whatever sort of um, utilization of testing and measuring we've been able to do, see if they're, they're trending in the right direction. And uh, if, they're, if it's all good, we might roll it out again. We might change the exercises. Uh, we might emphasize one aspect more than another, but um, it's really that way ongoing throughout the course of a training year. Okay, so uh, let's start with the the tour day thing there. How do you fit that in a training day? Because obviously you've got all the technical skills as well. You're going to do that day. <clears throat> so you do it. How long are the sessions then? For for example, the neuro uh, was it the neuromuscular and the metabolic one. Yeah. So the neuro training we can actually get done within about forty minutes. I mean, none of my training program, I remember what Charles Pollockin said. And Charles Pollockin was the first strength and conditioning coach that I actually uh, saw in a seminar uh, many, many, many moons ago. Uh, and he talked about the idea of a training session should be around 45 minutes, hmm. which is more spits the, the hormonal profiles of individuals. So I've actually had that in the back of my mind probably ever since. So... I would say that the, the the neuro training session will be somewhere between, and we can get it done in as quickly as done as 25, 30 minutes, really. Mm, so almost like a primer. Yeah, it's, it becomes a primer, but it's got primer with a bit more oomph in it. 
Yeah. So, um, so I can get that done be, be at right the beginning of the training day. So after the uh, players have done whatever um, readiness they need to do to get uh, uh, cleared to go, and then had that discussion with each player going through and saying whether they're one hundred percent ready to go, and then we might, as I said earlier, use a French contrast method for that, and we can get that done relatively quickly. And then um, all the technical, tactical work will be done after that. So as you said, that speed power work has primed the work on the floor. And I, and I have uh, no injury worries because of the nature of the training session. It's going to actually set the player up rather than put the player yeah. in a disadvantage. And then at the end of the day, we'll come back and do the heavier, slower, or metabolic work when the training sessions are done. So... They'll come off the field or whatever, and then they might have, uh, if it's a double day training with the rugby, we might have lunch break in the middle of the day and then go back and do some unit work and then finish the day back in the weight room. And I think it sort of dovetails the rugby. So the rugby sits in the middle of the beginning and the more the metabolic and mechanical side of tra- training at the end. I really like that. I think that's, I think that neuromuscular side or that almost that primer stuff before the actual technical session is, especially in combat sports, isn't used. Um, I think because people just stick, they just did when they're trained, there's just too high volume. <laughs> and then, and then, they're, and then they're fucked when they go into, into their technical training, you know, and, and, and that becomes the issue. If you do that incorrectly, it can uh, cause more harm than good. A hundred percent. That's why I, I really never try and do any of the mechanical style training before I do any of the running. Because the emphasis, obviously, particularly if it's unless it's an upper body system, if you've decided to split your training day or split your training week, so you do an upper body, lower body split, then sure you can do your mechanic, your mechanical type work for upper body before you do a rugby specific or or heavy running type, uh, either intensity or volume related uh, rugby session. Uh, but if it's a lower body, then I want it to be the players to be fresh to do their rugby related activities and all hamstring soft tissue type work towards the end of the day when they're not going to actually do any more running for that particular day. Before getting back to the podcast, I want to let you know there's a link down in the description for the Sweet Sounds of Fighting underground community. You can get all the help you need for your combat sports training. You get every single Sweet Sounds of Fighting training program, online course, and you get access to a range of coaches within the private Discord community. So go check that out and back to the podcast. Yeah. And, and we talked about primers as well. So pr- primers is something I use pretty extensively and rugby before before matches i don't know how much you've you've used them as well but i remember i kind of took the way i did them i listened to nick gill he presented like the sprints conference this was like this was at least over 10 years ago and he mentioned about uh how he would make the primer the same every week so it was always the same it was basically one routine don't even dive into that so i guess for any of the anyone listening like a primer would be something like a very short and sharp speed and power workout you would do 24 well, even six hours before probably probably not most of it six to like 48 hours before a big competition that the idea would be to enhance performance of that competition so you want to maybe just jump into into your method for that yeah sure i i tend to move more to a, a player driven session towards the end of the week as we get closer to the games yeah and my philosophy behind that is basically the players are going to solve problems on the field. Yeah. So I'm going to try and transfer ownership from the program from the very early stages of the week, which is more recovery-based, say, uh, game day plus two. Yeah. Uh, the coaches will be more involved in game day plus three, game day plus four, and then basically the players are, are re-taking ownership towards the back end of the week. So that really means that, I'll have a couple of different primer type sessions available for the players to choose from. Okay. Out of my experiences, I, be, I believe that some players like to do a gym based primer, mm-hmm. whereas some players like to, to get out and do a field based primer with some speed, some acceleration type work. So, and there's a rare few that like to combine a little bit with both, which I like to call a, a speed power combo. Yeah. So, so, I have really three options for the players to choose from. Um, or if the player doesn't like to do any of those, I'm not going to force them to do something they don't mm. want to do. Again, lack of compliance is going to be a, a program killer straight away. So they may prefer to do a, a, a more mobility session 
Yeah. Uh, before they before they go after the say captain's run that game day minus one, or even the the session itself. But um, uh, the primary related activities could be. I mean, I had uh, when I was working in Scotland, I had uh, one player or two players that actually really loved to do three sets of three at about seventy percent max power clean. Mm -hmm. um, and the setup at uh, Murrayfield in Scotland in Edinburgh is such that. Um, the, uh, the home locker room backs onto the gym. So mm. these guys actually immediately go in to um, put the gym shoes on, head for a platform, warm up, and then do three sets of three as fast as they possibly move the bar, um, and then walk back into the locker room and get ready and go out for three game warm ups. So mm. if you don't have to do that, then you might do it the day before or come in the morning before and, of the, the morning of the game and do something if you, if you want to be gym based. If it's more speed based, we might do some um, um, high intensity, very low volume plyometrics, some accelerations with sleds, uh, some toad work, some um, harness and release type activities, and all that sort of thing, or med ball throws uh, are all very important as far as um, primary activities. And then the session itself would be no more than 15 minutes. Yeah. And the volume is very, very low. Intensity tries to be as close to 90 plus percent as we can get. And then, um, Back to ready to go for the game. No, I, I like that. I think uh, in combat sports, obviously, there's the weight cut to tend with. So I think people kind of to and fro from that. But it definitely can be done, especially if the weigh-in's very far away from the fight or even the morning of after you've refueled. So it's definitely some an area that I think that could make it make its way in here too, just just for that aspect. I mean, I like that power clean one. That That's really nice. And I, I know from myself, if I do a weightlifting session before I go to jiu-jitsu training... I feel awesome. Like that's that's my warm up. You know, I'm yep. and I'm ready to go, and, and and I don't feel negatively affected. I don't have, like for example, if I was doing some bodybuilding routine, yeah, I would I would have problems. I would have problems starting to train. You know, but yeah, it's, it's a different feeling. I think I when I worked in basketball, which was my first professional sport back in the, or oh, let me see, um, the 1990s, <laughs> um, we used to do um, a hand clean push press. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the game of basketball in the in the say the shooting mechanics of uh, most basketball players, I mean, a hand clean push press is identical to um, a jump shot. Mm. So, and you could actually do it with dumbbells if you wanted to, and do it single arm with a dumbbell even more specifically. I think even more so now after being thirty years on from uh, my first uh, jobs with basketball, I would probably do a um, uh, a one arm. You say unilateral dumbbell clean and push press mm. as my primer for basketball, which I think makes it even more specific. Um, and again, you, you only need to do three sets of three, three sets of five. Um, and that's going to be done in less than five minutes and you're good yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I wanted to come back to, to your circuits as well with, with the uh, metabolic loading there that, that you have. What, 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 how do those circuits look? Is that does that take? Does that take over from normal strength training then? Like that would be the strength training for the athlete. They would have just the circuits as part of that. And then their other conditioning would be on the field as well. A little bit of both actually, because um, I remember I had uh, one player and uh, he needed to some drop some um, drop some pudding that he put on over the course of the uh, off season. And um, we decided to do a circuit program three sessions a week. And he was, um, he was a prop. And he was really concerned that he was going to lose strength because that uh, he wasn't doing any direct strength work. And to I, I knew he was going to get stronger, um, but it was a matter of uh, basically doing it and uh, proving it to him in the process. So we did this for about three weeks where we just focused on uh, what I've termed a beastly circuit, which is six exercises performed for six reps of each exercise as a continuous, you don't you try not to put the bar down once you picked it up for the 36 reps. And the standard one I used to do was um, uh, power clean, deadlift, uh, deadlift, power clean, front squat, push press, uh, bent over row, uh, RDL to finish off. So six exercises with the same weight. And uh, and then they'd jump on and do a cardiovascular movement for um two to three minutes of high intensity uh, work. Could be an um, uh, interval type program, could be a uh, Tabata style, it could be a set distance and how quickly they can do it on a row machine, a, a climber machine or some, some um, mm. 
distal um, method. And then when we went straight into a strength program, and he was actually using about 10 to 15 percent heavier than he'd used in the previous season uh, on his maximal strength workouts. Mm. So it transferred really, really well. He was over the moon, as you can imagine, that yeah. he was dropping body fat, improving his metabolic condition, and he was actually doing the job at the same time. But for most individuals, I like to include a, a strength component either before, primarily before because of the neuro. Um, yeah. So it could just be a simple uh, lower body push or pull and an upper body push or pull. Mm. So the volume's quite low, and it could be like three sets of three circuits to three sets of five as far as the strength protocols are concerned. And then the circuit, and then finishing off whatever I've termed what's called a care program, which is a core accessory rehab exercise program. So whatever that individual has areas of weakness, previous injury history, the injuries that are most prevalent in playing that position on the field, need to be addressed. So they might be neck, hamstring, calf, uh, yeah. rotate off, and um, a lot of carry or something like that. So that will finish the program. So you look at that strength component first, again, probably inside of 15 minutes. You look at the circuit, 25 to 30 minutes, and another 10 to 15 minutes for your care at the end of it. So again, you're looking at a, a, a pretty solid hour, yeah. and you basically done it looking at all aspects. How, how much weight was this prop using for that circuit? Uh, he was using a 60 kilogram bar. Yeah, Damn, that's still tough. Oh, it's, <laughs> well, if you've never done it before, I've, I've had people just doing an Olympi empty Olympic bar and, and having to basically stop halfway through. <laughs> I might have to give this a go, mate. Maybe, to, maybe over the weekend, oh, it's <laughs> just, just to see. I, I think that would fit really nicely with any um, like grappler, jiu-jitsu, mm. judoka, um, yeah. any of those sports. I think a beastly circuit is would be my go-to. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan of of the Olympic lifts for for grappling style arts and and weightlifting complexes. I'm actually going to do a bunch of YouTube videos on that soon, so everyone listening can look out for those coming. But um, uh, I wanted to also also cover how you progress some of these because you mentioned there you might do say four to six weeks of whichever one they need then they might shift to kind of another i guess goal depending on what they need but say it's the same thing neuro um, metabolic and maybe they finish the four to six weeks and they still need to continue what kind of changes are you making then throughout to keep progressing i, th I think i've i've used over the years a, a quadrant management system for training and the four quadrants based around a player's experience and training age so the initial quadrant, quadrant run one is the actual players don't get a choice. It's a dictatorship and I'm the dictator and you're going to do what I think you need to yeah. do in the end of story. So that's often the way with, with younger athletes and players that have come from a different program that I've yet to be able to assess. So we use that first four to six weeks as the dictatorship. The next quadrant is they get one degree of freedom, so which is exercise selection. Mm. They'll decide which exercise within the categories that we're actually utilising, whether it's a, like a hinge, whether it's a, a knee dominant move, it's upper body push, upper body pull, something like that. We'll have a big chart on the wall and they can actually determine which exercise they want to use. But I'm always there saying, well, you used a, a flat bench press last week. Uh, sorry, last um, block of training, four to six weeks. Um, how about we change further that into more an incline bench press now? Or let's um, go dumbbell bench press rather than uh, bench press with a bar, or let's change it up to a Swiss bar bench press or something like that. If you've got the luxury of special bars and things like that to work with. Then we move on to quadrant three, which is the player in discussion with the coach determines what sessions each week they actually do. And this is where, what well, we talked about earlier about that neuro um, neurometabolic, they might be neurometabolic. So we need to do one maybe pure neural session towards the uh, towards game day minus two. 
Yeah. We might do a metabolic session on the Monday, which will be game day plus two, which acts as a, a nice flush for the player as well. And then we might do more of a, a mechanical-based program on uh, game day plus three. Um, mm. But to, uh, the player and, and what they need, whether they do two sessions a week, three sessions a week, and how we orient to that, the player has a decision-making process in that. Mm. The fourth quadrant is... Myself as a strength and conditioning coach steps back and as works more as um, an advisor within the weight room. Obviously, I'm still going to be checking technique and I'm going to jump in. If I don't see something I like or something could be injurious, I'll put a halt to it. But the player determines their sets and reps, the percentages of load, um, based around their experience, experiential learning. So you've got a combination of what I've used over the years and, and I've just looked at a, a formula for it, is that wisdom, particularly training wisdom, equals knowledge raised to the power of experience. <laughs> so with a player, and again, we should never discount the experiences that the players bring to our discussions as far as training their bodies. So they're going to know more about themselves than we'll ever know. So by educating and, and this is the big key to um i believe strength and conditioning programs that are effective over time is the strength and conditioning coach is an educator all the way all the way yeah. so continually saying well having a look at this is a cluster this is what a cluster does this is what wave loading does so a player should be armed with different techniques to develop themselves over a period of time. You actually don't become redundant as a strength and conditioning coach, yeah. but your your education program should allow them to have a greater understanding about what the strength and conditioning program is trying to do. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And I actually wanted to get your take on the, on the idea of exercise selection, or at least exercise progression through blocks, because there's a few different thoughts on it, I guess. If you, if you take a pure powerlifting i guess philosophy is trying to stick with the same exercises over and over i mean even i think dan baker when he was with the broncos talks about you know they squat every week no matter what and they squat deep myself i tend to like to change or progress exercises every four to eight weeks depending um i think it keeps it fresh for for the athletes as well and and keeps them going in the gym and that novelty effect is also a thing but what, what's your take on that? are you sticking to like the same thing or are you looking to do variations throughout the training uh yeah uh, I am very, very conjugate based in my idea. So very influenced by uh, Lewis Simmons and Westside. And I like the idea of sticking with one exercise for a good four to six weeks. Yeah. And as a player becomes more experienced, I think they can actually drop that down. Probably not to the, the same extent that Westside would do with changing the exercise every week mm. and every session um i don't think our guys are that experienced in the weight room no matter how long they've been actually training for for their sport but it's the actual nature of changing the stimulus to avoid accommodation as the primary primary example but also to ensure that you're taking on a more multi multi-angular multi-plane physical mm -hmm. development program so uh, obviously a bench press is the, the king upper body uh, pressing movement. Is it the best exercise for a rugby player? I'd question that. But an incline bench press, a push press, you look at all those type movements, are affecting the, the upper body pushing category in certainly different, different ways by using different loads. And you have a, a progression of like almost an undulation periodization loading based on exercise and the weight that you can actually mm. use exercise. so not necessarily adjusting the load you use on the one exercise just adjust the exercise to change the loading yeah so you could yeah. go um military press incline press push press bench press over four weeks if you wanted to go back to one exercise a week mm. and see how that would change the undulation of loading um, based on just the exercise selection. Did you know you can represent Sweet Arts of Fighting while you're training? We're more than just a membership. We also have rash guards and shorts. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that we have the Sweet Arts of Fighting 2.0 shorts, and we also have the Sweet Arts of Fighting short and long sleeve rash guard. 
There is another design coming soon, but you can get those on xmarshall.com and you can go down the description and you can find that and back to the podcast. Yeah, that's a good point too. And I think as well, I know you're a big fan of uh, specialty bars too. Uh, I mean, I can't wait to get a whole bunch of specialty bars. I mean, I add my fat grips all the time to my bars too. Uh, what, what, are there any exercises that, that you're very fond of with, with specialty bars or, or anything like that? Oh, I think I'm on record as saying is that um, if I ever set my own weight room up uh, for conditioning or rugby players, again, I probably wouldn't have too many straight bars in the place. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'd want to have a couple of good um, Olympic-style bars for doing uh, Olympic variation work with. Yeah. And, and a good power bar, powerlifting bar uh, for deadlifts and squats. But that's if the player has no injury history that uh, they can actually perform those more traditional movements with those tradi more traditional bars. But um, I am a massive fan of the safety squat bar, the trap bar, and the Swiss bar. Mm. They'd be my three go-to. So that rather than the original Bill Star Big Three of yeah. the power squat and uh, bench press, I'd be looking at the, the big three of specialty bars of uh, trap bar, uh, Swiss bar and safety yeah. squat bar. Yeah, I, I fall in a, a similar camp where if I had, if I had the option, no player would bench press with a, a barbell. It would be either fat axle bars, Swiss bars, anything else. Like the, the difference, so like I, if I do bench press or bench press off pins, I always add the fat grips and the difference it makes is unreal. Like to thicken oh. the hands and the wrists. Like if you haven't done it for a long time and you get heavy loads and you have the fat bar, like your thumbs hurt <laughs> and, and wow. it conditions the hands like crazy that's incredible i think and and particularly with working with um grapplers and fighters um i recently bought a uh, revolving axle bar from elite fts oh, and nice. it's got a really nice knurling on it as well because axle bars i've used in the past have been quite smooth yeah and do, doing hang planes or hang pulls with this Almost three inch uh, axle bar Damn. has been <laughs> unbelievable. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fat, the fat power clean and press is one of my favorites. Favorites too. That it is one of my go tos. But I want to bring this back a little bit to the conditioning side. And obviously, there's different. I've talked to a range of different coaches, coaches on this. Obviously, you've got like an energy system or physiology kind of dominant thought process of hey, I'm. We're prescribing this because we're after these specific adaptations and there's more of like a work capacity kind of thought like outputs like hey we need to just be able to do this amount of work with this amount of rest at this whatever output over and over and over again and improve that i guess where do you kind of fit in that camp are you prescribing conditioning based on hey this is aerobic anaerobic etc or are you looking more at, hey we just need to be able to do 30 seconds um at higher intensities etc it's a very interesting question because I would say that my conditioning programs and, and things that I used over the years is a combination of uh, development of a really good, solid aerobic system. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, and uh, I think that's the, that's the key to uh, particularly uh, most amateur rugby players, if they really improve their aerobic conditioning, um, they don't need to worry about everything else. I think being strong, oh, sorry, being skilled, being strong and being fit are your big three for, for amateur players. When we get more into the professional level, obviously we've got elements where we consider about, um, and the phrase worst case scenario has been used quite a lot for the type mm -hmm. of training. So we're looking at, Within a game where we've got a certain uh, number of metres per minute, if you have the luxury of using GPS, uh, and we want to train above, say, 15 to 20% above that worst-case scenario in a game, which we can address by using modified games and modified um, uh, conditioning elements within the game itself. So we might play a, um, like a shoulders-on two-ball touch for say three to five minutes or uh, at mm -hmm. at game or above and i will get most of my these days conditioning for the game based around using those particular games mm. now unfortunately the only problem we have with less skilled players 
is that the ball will be yeah. out through to poor decision making versus poor skill ac- skill levels. So the actual quality of the session nose dives really effectively. Hence why I really think that amateur players really really emphasise the skill development side of things. When you're working and you have a, sk- a low skill level, then we need to introduce some of these more uh, repeat speed type sessions, um, MAS grids and, and areas of training where players don't necessarily enjoy them, but they know they're going to get better yeah. results and performance through them. But ideally, I'd like to use as much uh, small-sided games as possible to actually get that. Mm. Uh, which I think has also been called fuel mixed conditioning over a period of time. Or also using a game with a wrestle component. I love using yeah. a wrestle Say a, a five-minute block of a, a small-sided game, a short rest, and then a five-minute block of wrestling, mm-hmm. and then going back and forward between them for say two or three times. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a classic classic rugby session. That one, I think, for for any of the combat combat athletes listening, it'll be it'll be kind of similar to when we're talking small-sided games, or it'll be like very aspiring aspiring mm-hmm. stuff there. But it's funny because you mentioned obviously the worst-case scenario stuff. So what what we did in in Romania is we actually. We tried to bring it into the idea that we play the structures faster. So we wanted the players to, so we did over, what was it? 10% um, over the peak meters per minute of our fastest match in a three or five minute block. <clears throat> and then we just played structures, attack structures with the shields. And then when they got close to the try line, they just kicked it down and repeat, or we threw a ball in and things like that. So similar, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was the right way to go about it or not. I mean, it, dudes would dudes were blowing afterwards, and they'd have to play that structure at speed. But whether it translates to a game, yes, because obviously in a game you've got more things to contend with in the ruck, and if things go go wrong and things like that. But I don't know. It's uh, something I'm still I'm still wrestling with in my head, but also still wrestling with the idea of conditioning, not just being about energy systems, but again being about outputs as well and not everything has to be about trying to target some certain adaptation it can be just improving the work capacity of a certain interval yeah i think the i think the the remaining experience you had there is just like uh, conditioning has to be to make players better rugby players yeah so and i've had some really good rugby players who have almost the cardiovascular systems of plants they yeah. lose oxygen, they don't produce it. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, the other way around, sorry. Um, so, what a, and I've had, I had a, a classic, um, uh, I had a Fijian ringer once who's, and back in that day when the NZRU used to have a 3K time trial as their mm. principal aerobic test. So, you're looking at a, a man who is so explosive over a short distance yeah. and his 3K time is going to be absolutely diabolical. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, th- I think in this particular case, I think I actually walked 3Ks faster than he ran it. I've had a player like that before. The, my first gig in Romania, we had a, a Tongan guy. He was one of our best players and he was a fullback. But I think his his 1.6K time trial that we did for a mass test was like little, slower than the props. <laughs> oh, I mean, this particular player said, he said, tongue in cheek, but I think he was a little bit more serious than just tongue in cheek. He said, um, hey, Ash, how about I just run um, 3100s and you just and just use that time? Add, add, add the time's up. <laughs> and you would have to happily run 30 by 100. Give me an example. This, this guy was so slow. Um, that he was he would be lapped by players, but I remember this one game uh, that he played in, and we were on full attack, and he was pushing forward on the left left wing side, and uh, the ball got turned over, and the ball went pass, pass, pass on the opposition to their opponent's left wing. Yeah, and. This player had to get himself off the ground. He wasn't a small player by any strength of imagination. Get off the ground, assess, turn, and chase. And he caught the opposition player just as he was about to score the try. Damn. Grappled with him, stripped the ball, and started running back up to the 22. Damn. 
no amount of 3K time trials is going to give him that. Yeah, no, for sure. So what would you do? We've we've got four minutes left before this thing cuts off, but what would you do if, say, an athlete had that kind of profile? They were super explosive, just didn't have the engine, but they need to have the engine to compete, you know, in a game of rugby or or in combat sport. Yeah, I think this is where sled walking and sled work is is a much Mm. under area of uh, conditioning for rugby players. I think um, particularly what Louis Simmons has done a lot with the, with the sled walking is looking at that exaggerated power stride of a step. And if you read some of his work working with runners, particularly say 400, 800, 1500 meter runners, and looking at towing or pulling the sled for a period of time associated with their particular uh, event. And not only is it protective of soft tissue and hamstrings and calves, it actually really develops the strength levels in those muscle groups as well. Mm. And also gives gives a great metabolic effect. I mean, if you've ever, again, perfect for, for grapplers, again, you imagine hanging on to a, a sandbag. Mm. That's right, with Dan John. Uh, Dan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or sled at the yeah. same time. I've done I mean, that. <laughs> better as far as specific transfer to your sport of rugby or your sport of grappling so yeah um i would and I, i've written recently uh in elite fts about the the conundrum about the the bigger the bigger players are usually the people who need more fitness but we can't actually train them the same way for fitness mm. because they can't tolerate that level of loading because they're big big guys in the first place so we need to find different methods of utilization of, say, off feet conditioning, mm. walking, um, general preparation, uh, physical preparation. So GPP work has to be a high priority for that metabolic group that we need to work with. And I think I'd do a lot more of that work, still based all around my conditioning games, because obviously the players, A, they like doing it. Yeah. It's a, a lot more... Uh, transfer of eye hand coordination and spatial awareness and uh, teamwork and and just having a good time. But um, by adding that GPP work at the back end of that particular session, we can actually cover those bases as well. No, that's awesome. And we'll have to we'll have to end it here, Ash, with a, with a couple of minutes left. But if people want to find what you're doing, follow you, all of that, where can they do that? I think they're probably the two best places. Um, I don't have much of a social media presence, but um, I write a regular monthly column for uh, at EliteFTS.com. Uh, I'm in my 11th year of writing that column, so and wow. all my articles are, are up on that website for you to, to, to go back through and, and have a look at the things I've written in the past. Uh, but the other one I spend a lot of time working with is the um, a Facebook page, the National Strength and Conditioning Association Rugby special interest group so if you went to uh nsca um rugby sig on uh, on in facebook and we have a thousand members there on that particular uh website and uh james you're one of them i know yep and <laughs> what i try to do is put as much rugby information uh from the game itself from sevens rugby league um 15s women's uh, wheelchair rugby as well, as well as conditioning and strength and, and different yeah. training programs as well. So yeah. that particular website, um, I, I spend quite a bit of time on and uh, <laughs> people can join up and uh, we can develop things from there. Perfect. Now I'll link those in the description, but, but thanks for coming on, Ash. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much, James. It's been uh, great chatting to you and uh, I look forward to doing it. And hopefully uh, you'll be at the NSCA National Conference in July and we can actually uh, have oh, a yes. bit of- Yeah, we'll definitely chat. Awesome.